Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Sacedo's classroom. This is going to be the scientific method. So make sure that you have your notes and that you are following along. So, of course, we have to define what is exactly the scientific method. So the scientific method is a systematic approach to gather evidence and solve problems. So depending on who you talk to, there could be many different numbers of steps in the scientific method, but we're going to say that there are five, and these are our five steps. Making observations, forming a hypothesis, testing a hypothesis, analyzing data, and evaluating results. So let's talk about that very first step in the scientific method, which is making observations. So if you were to ask somebody on the street what exactly is an observation, they'd probably think it has to involve just, you know, looking at something or sight. But it can be using any of your senses to notice or describe something. So that includes smell, that's supposed to be a nose. It includes taste, that's supposed to be a tongue. It includes hearing, which that's supposed to be an ear. And even touch, that's supposed to be a hand. So when we're in lab, we're going to be using all of your senses because all of your senses are valuable when studying science. Now, even though we're not going to be tasting a whole bunch of things, um, in certain situations we might. And so just make sure that you are recording down all of your observations when we do our labs. Now let's move on to our second step, which is forming a hypothesis. What is a hypothesis? It is a testable statement or a prediction about what has been observed. So normally when we're writing our hypotheses, they take the form of if then statements. So if I do this, then this will happen. Now let's move on to our third step in the scientific method, which is testing a hypothesis. Well, how do you test it? You test it by doing an experiment. So what is an experiment? It's a set of controlled observations that test your hypothesis. And the key word there is the word controlled. So the pictures that you see at the bottom here are of a uh, experiment to see which type of light uh, grows certain types of plants the best. So how would you create sort of an experiment? Um, you would need to control as many variables as you can. And even though this isn't the best example right now, because uh, in the pictures at least, there isn't anything really separating these plants other than very, very thin pieces of glass, there are normally things covering them up. Okay, so uh, you would need like the same type of plant in the bottom. You would need different colored lights at the top. You would need to make sure that you are watering them the same amount, that you are getting them the same amount of light, even though they're different colored lights, that they are not really sort of interacting with each other, that you have the same environment. And so um, that's what an experiment is. It's a set of controlled observations that you make to test a hypothesis. In every experiment, there are two different groups. You have control and you have experimental. Control groups are used for comparison. And control groups are sort of the usual everyday condition. Whereas experimental groups, you are changing something, and so you are exposing that group to a different variable or to something that you're actually modifying or changing. The very first uh, example of a good controlled experiment was actually Francesco Reddy, and it was a very long time ago. What he wanted to figure out was what caused maggots to actually come out of meat. And so he designed a controlled experiment to do this. In his control group, he left just jars of meat out in the open, and those were in coming into contact with flies. So as flies landed, maggots started to grow on the inside of the meat. Whereas in his experimental group, he covered that jar with very thin pieces of gauze so that the flies were not able to actually get into the jar. Instead, they just had to fly away. And he found that maggots did not grow in those sort of pieces of meat. And so he had an experimental group, which he actually modified something with by putting gauze over it, and he had a control group, which is just meat out in the open, as it was. And so that's an example of both control and experimental. So there are three variables involved in every experiment, and the first of which we call the independent variable. That is the variable that we actually change and manipulate as scientists. So in Francesco Reddy's experiment, it was that very thin piece of gauze that he put over the top. That's what he was changing. In our example of the different plants growing under different lighting conditions, uh, it would be the different colored lights. That's what we're changing in that experiment. The dependent variable, on the other hand, is something that you observe or measure after changing the independent variable. So in the case of Francesco Reddy, it was how many flies or maggots actually were coming out of the meat. Uh, in the case of, again, using our plant example, 
uh, it would be how much actually did this plant grow in red light or in blue light or in green light or in white light. So the dependent variable is something that you measure. The last type of variable that we have are called constants, and those are factors that you want to keep the same. So for Francesco Redi's experiment, he had the same amount of meat in the bottom of each uh, jar. Uh, he also had the same amount of flies, they were kept in the same location, the same amount of sunlight outside, etc. He wanted to keep everything the same. Those are constants. In our plant example, uh, you want to make sure that the plant that you're using is exactly the same. You don't just have two different types of plants out there. That It's receiving the same amount of light, the same amount of water, the same amount of soil, and all of the other factors are kept the same as well. That's the point of constants. Now our fourth step in the scientific method is now analyzing our data. What is data? It's evidence that you gather from your experiment. So that evidence that you're going to be collecting, uh, you compare your experimental group's results to your control group's results. So in the case of Francesco Redi, you were looking at, you know, the number of flies uh, or maggots. In the case of the different plants growing underneath your lighting conditions, uh, you'd see which ones grew the most, which ones grew the least, which ones didn't grow at all. Uh, this guy, Louis Pasteur, wanted to know sort of why things spoiled, and so he collected lots of data about that and figured out that it's actually dust and microscopic things in that dust that cause things to go bad. There are two broad types of data, and we're going to be looking at both whenever we do labs, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is numerical, which means it has numbers in it. Qualitative is descriptive, and so there are no numbers in it. So for example, in this picture, quantitative data would be that there are four dolphins in this pod. Uh, on the other hand, if you were describing the... Uh, type of dolphin that they are, bottlenose dolphins, or their gender, or something else, that would be qualitative data. In this picture, we have two foxes, but if you were telling me that they were red foxes, uh, that would be qualitative data. So quantitative involves numerical stuff, qualitative involves everything but numerical stuff. It's descriptive. Our final step in the scientific method is finally to evaluate our results, and so there are a couple of things we need to talk about there. The first of which is called an inference. An inference is a logical conclusion supported by the data that you collected. We are going to be writing inferences, okay? Those are our conclusions that we write in um, scientific lab reports. Now, when enough data and trials have been collected, then scientists might consider it a theory. An inference and a theory are not the same thing. An inference is something small, something that we maybe do a couple of times. A theory, though, that has to have a whole bunch of data and numerous trials before scientists might even consider it a theory. So what exactly is a theory? Well, a theory is an explanation based on many observations and investigations over time. It is not the same as an inference, just like I said earlier. Uh, they can explain why something happens. That's something that an inference can't do. An inference is just your conclusion after doing, you know, sort of one lab, which might have three trials. A theory, on the other hand, uh, can start to explain why something happens, because now you've collected enough data that it's becoming statistically relevant. Uh, another important thing to kind of get out of this is that theories are not guesses. A lot of times, colloquially, we kind of use the term theory to mean like, oh, that's just a theory. Um, what we should be thinking is that's just a hypothesis. Hypothesis is just a guess. A theory is not a guess. And one of the most important things and what makes science so cool is that theories can change. So, for example, we thought that stress was the primary factor that causes ulcers in your stomach and in your intestines. But what we found out was there's actually bacteria in your stomach that can cause um, ulcers. And so we can change our entire theory based on new evidence that we collect. Now last but not least, we have to talk about scientific laws. And so the difference between a scientific law and a theory is pretty straightforward. Scientific law is a relationship found in nature that is supported by experiments. It doesn't explain why something happens, it just states a relationship. Scientific laws are almost always going to be mathematical. So for example, we have P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. That's called Boyle's Law. And it's called Boyle's Law because it relates pressure to volume. 
pressure goes up, volume goes down. If pressure goes down, volume goes up. And so uh, scientific laws are almost always going to be mathematical in nature. And again, they don't explain why something happens. They merely state a relationship that is true in nature. Theories, on the other hand, they try to explain why something actually happens. So these are our five steps in the scientific method. Make sure that you understand them and all of their subpoints.